true that the individual is the son of his time. And therefore, if so we are dependent in our thought on certain fundamental premises belonging to our time or epoch or culture, whatever you call it, and yet these principles cannot claim to possess universal or eternal validity. Again, this has become very trivialized, and every one of you will know it from high school at the latest. Political philosophy, according to this view, must deal with the ideals of our time or of our society. To raise the question whether these ideals of our time or of our society are the true ideals is impossible and therefore forbidden. Political philosophy cannot go beyond, cannot question those ideals which are in fact accepted. I will not go, uh, you not even dream of uh, making any criticism of this position. I will turn only to another practical consequence of this, of historicism. Historicism can be said to say that while political philosophy is impossible, if we take the word political philosophy in any strict sense, not in the sense in which people speak of the philosophy of a man who is my philosophy to take two eggs for breakfast. I have heard such things. Now, if, uh, if we take it in any serious sense, then they say political philosophy is impossible. Yet, while political philosophy is impossible, the history of political philosophy is the history of political philosophy is possible and even necessary. This is, I believe, an, a point where, which you also know, uh, if, not, if for, from no other source, at least from the announcement of the courses of political science department, that this is a perfectly acceptable view today. And the reasoning would roughly be this. We must reach some understanding of ourselves, of the institutions of the country, of our thoughts, and so on, so on of our ideals. Now, these institutions and ideals are proof on inspection to be derivative from or modifications of older institutions, older ideas, and so on, so that the clarification of the present, the knowledge of ourselves, as we could almost say, is not possible except in the form of historical reflection. Now, this conclusion that history of political philosophy is necessary is admitted also by the positivists. There are few people who, uh, from time to time, you hear a kind of young Turks who say there should be no history of political philosophy in political science departments, but they should be given in humanities courses. But this has remained quite ineffective up to the present day, at least. So somehow, it is for some reasons which are not always easy to fathom, it is admitted by the profession as profession that history of political philosophy is necessary. So, and this is a very a gratifying thing, because here we are on a ground which is common to all or almost all contemporary political scientists. And we must always be grateful if there is some common ground. <laughs> now, from this, what is universally granted, there follows a conclusion which is, I think, also universally granted in theory, although not necessarily obeyed in practice, namely that the history of political philosophy must be studied with the necessary care and assiduity. I mean, that is clear. I mean, if history of political philosophy, it must be done well. Otherwise, it is a disgraceful thing. So we must be happy about these two things commonly admitted. But uh, we must, however, not conceal from ourselves a certain ambiguity. Those who are not convinced by the denial of the possibility of political philosophy, by positivism or historicism, 
will study the history of political philosophy in the expectation that political philosophy can be restored or recovered. They are open to the possibility of political philosophy, whereas the positivists and historicists are close to it. In other words, this difference of motivation is very important and may also have practical consequences. But I put the emphasis now only on what is universally granted or generally granted and not on the differences. Now, I come now to the third point. Why a platonic dialogue? If we must study the history of political philosophy, we must pay particular attention to its origins. For the origin is the time at which it was being established or about to be established. After it had become established or become a tradition, it is likely to have been taken for granted Whereas in the moment of its origins, it was not taken for granted. Its possibility or necessity still had to be established. Now, where do we find that origin? According to the traditional view, the originator of political philosophy was Socrates. This is today not universally admitted, not, not at all. But uh, let me only s assert it here, that I think this old-fashioned traditional view is still is true. It only needs some footnotes, you know, mm -hmm. but the substance of the statement would not be affected with it. You all have heard that there were men who were so-called sophists prior to Socrates, and some people say they were political philosophers, and some other men. I cannot go into that now, and it's not necessary. So Socrates is at any rate, is I think also generally, as is generally admitted, a very important uh, man as far as the origin of political philosophy is concerned. But Socrates has one great effect, which is also universally known. He did not write books. And therefore, if we want to study the origins of political philosophy, we have practically no choice but to study Plato. Naturally, we, it is very important to study Aristotle, but there is an important difference between Plato and Aristotle in this respect. In Plato, we can observe the ascent from the pre-philosophic or pre-scientific understanding of politics to political philosophy. Whereas in Aristotle, political philosophy is already constituted as a science, established as a science. You only have to compare the beginning of Aristotle's politics, the first ten lines, let me say, with the first ten lines of Plato's Republic to see the difference. The politics, we can say, is a treatise. The Republic and the other works of Plato are dialogues. I must say something about this implication. What does this mean? When we read the politics, we hear Aristotle talking to us all the time, unless he quotes someone. But even then, it is the quotation as being a quotation by Aristotle, is Aristotle speaking. But when we read a Platonic dialogue, we hear only Plato's characters, never Plato himself. Because even if a dialogue is merely told, narrated, and not performed, Plato is never the narrator. Now, this has some implications. So we, we want to, we are eager to know what Plato said, and we never hear him. But there is a simple answer. Plato has mouthpieces. For example, in the dialogue which we are going to discuss, the Mino is of course not a mouthpiece of, of Plato. I say of course, and I should add, a question mark. Why, of course? But I, leave, I don't go into that now. And 
Plato's mouthpiece is especially, of course, Socrates. But Socrates is not always a mouthpiece. In the laws, Plato's laws, his largest work, uh, for example, the mouthpiece is an Athenian stranger, not Socrates. Why did Plato have, or does Plato have a variety of such mouthpieces? He doesn't tell us. Plato doesn't tell us anything. 